my name is William Corliss and this is the Workplace Podcast. Brought to you in association with Yellowwood, providers of executive coaching, corporate training and facilitation. Your external learning and development partner. Each week we focus on a different aspect of the workplace. We hear from guest speakers who will be subject matter experts, who I believe are incredibly talented at what they do. These experts will give you a different perspective and insight to work life, with the aim of empowering you to take a different path to success in all aspects of work life. These perspectives will include career and personal success, leadership, high performance teams, and creating a better work life culture in your organization. Yellowwood, take a different path to success with your career, team, and organization. Welcome to the Workplace Podcast. Our topic today is Masterful Mediation, Insights into Conflict with Ken Cloak. Ken Cloak is a world-recognized mediator, dialogue facilitator, conflict resolution systems designer, teacher, public speaker, author of numerous books and articles, and a pioneer and leader in the field of mediation and conflict resolution for over 40 years. Ken Welcome to the Workplace Podcast. It is a wonderful privilege of mine to speak to one of the pioneers of mediation. I thoroughly enjoyed your book, Mediating Dangerously, The Frontiers of Conflict Resolution. You have been a mediator since 1980 and that profession has evolved over time. So for, so for emergent mediators, what advice would you give them? I would say the first piece of advice is no matter how many mediations you've done, for how many years, um, each one is different. Um, Carl Jung, uh, famous uh, Swiss psychoanalyst, said that he had, in the course of his life, analyzed over 80,000 dreams. And every dream he heard, he had to forget all 80,000 in order to be fresh and new for each one. And I think this is important in conflict. So the very moment that you think that you've got it, you've just lost it. Um, Because the important thing is to um, discover in the moment what is taking place in that exact moment in the conflict, because that's the place where the opening reveals itself. Um, It's the place where people are telling you what is happening right now that can be useful for them. So it's always fresh and always new and always different, and you're always a beginner. Um, And having said that, I think there are some things that come uh, with experience. One of those is a belief, uh, really not just a belief, a, um, uh, a deep understanding of why it is that no matter how stuck you are, there is some possible way forward. Um, You you may not be able to see it, uh, but the fact that you know that it is somewhere hidden in their uh, their conflict gives you the courage to, and the patience um, to stick around and keep looking uh, for whatever that opening may happen to be. And then the second piece of advice I would say Uh, is to search for the place where empathy and honesty meet. So if you are honest without being empathetic, you'll be perceived as being cruel or brutal or uh, not caring. And if you're empathetic without being honest, uh, you'll be very nice, but you won't make a difference. So the trick is to find the place where those two things meet. Um, And the book that you referred to before, Mediating Dangerously, is an effort to try to identify what dangerous honesty looks like and what dangerous empathy looks like uh, and how to bring them into some kind of bridging connection inside of you. Um, So empathy is a source of information about what is happening inside Uh, yourself um, that resonates with what is happening inside others. And honesty is a way of uh, uh, getting perspective 
of looking at things as though from the outside. So everybody in conflict loses perspective uh, and everybody gets lost internally. Um, and so uh, if we are able within ourselves to join them, uh, that's the first step. But if we just join them, we have discovered the conflict inside of ourselves and we haven't figured a way out. So we also have to bring to it something that is not empathetic, something that is outside of them and outside of us. And that's where the analysis of systems um, and structures and processes and relationships comes into play. So um, we want to be scientists, but we also want to be poets. Um, we want to be sensitive to um, all of the deep emotional uh, kind of experience that people are having in their conflicts uh, and to feel that as immediately as we can inside of us, because that is a source of information. Uh, and then what we want to do is to look at it generally as well. There, there's a kind of, um, this is going to sound a little bizarre, uh, but we're going to start by um, thinking for a second about Einstein's general theory of relativity. Uh, which makes no sense whatsoever, except here's what Einstein basically did. Um, he said that, G that gravity um, isn't exactly a force, it's the curvature of space. So his equation of general relativity has curvature on one side and mass on the other side. And there was a famous physicist in the United States, his name is John Wheeler, John Archibald Wheeler. Uh, and his summary of Einstein's theory was matter tells space how to curve. Space tells matter how to move. And so it's kind of, a, it's a little bit like that with um, empathy and honesty. Um, that empathy is kind of about the curvature of inner space. Um, uh, it is, you can think of it as kind of the form, uh, if you like uh, Le Corbusier uh, as an architect uh, and the idea of form follows function. Uh, yes, form follows function and function uh, follows form. So uh, there's this relationship, this conversation taking place uh, between um, uh, kind of what uh, a conflict feels like and what it means. Um, and now we have to really uh, bring together the two hemispheres of our brains. So mediation is a whole brain process. Um, on the one hand, we need emotional intelligence. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, we need theory. Um, uh, some uh, ability to generalize uh, and abstract from the immediate situation and look at it kind of holistically. So uh, I would say the, the important thing to do, uh, the piece of advice for young mediators is to feel people's conflicts as deeply as you can, but without losing your capacity for perspective. So I hope that is helpful. This episode was brought to you in association with the Mediation Foundation of Ireland, Europe's premier provider of mediation certification and training. For more information, check out mfi.ie. It's very comforting for me as a mediator to know that you're treating everything fresh. There is that challenge that it's new beginnings, and with new beginnings always brings that, uh-oh, what are we facing with here? Again, it's about trusting yourself in terms of the theory. Mm -hmm. beginning to, and it's about getting the balance right between that honesty and that empathy and the relationship between the two. And sometimes we, it is that trap that we fall into is maybe getting too empathetic or being too honest. How do we, how do we get that balance? How do we offer that honesty 
given that perspective, is it through indirect questioning or in your practice, do you offer that honesty directly then? I'm just concerned about yeah. the impartiality piece. Did well, uh, two things. One is um, I have a kind of reframe of impartiality or neutrality, um, which is mm. um, uh, what I call omnipartiality. Uh, or being on both people's sides at the same time. And I really mean that. I mean actually being on their side at the same time, which doesn't mean agreeing with the whatever it is that they're saying uh, about what the facts are, um, but it means actually kind of create, being able to create a human connection. The fundamental problem is that... Uh, we approach issues digitally uh, as a binary problem. And anything that is complex has more than one side to it. And so when we approach it as though there's only one piece of information that we need to look at, I think of that as being one dimensional in our approach. But two pieces of information makes us two dimensional three makes us three-dimensional. Um, and in each of those movements to a higher dimensionality, we get a higher degree of freedom. The ability now to look at something from a very, very different perspective. The question is, how are you actually able to be on both people's sides at the same time? And I think that the answer is by recognizing the deeper underlying truth of what it is that they are saying. And that requires a level of honesty that can be dangerous. So the best way of approaching it, I find, is not through declaratory statements, but through, through questions. But now you can ask questions that can take people's breath away. Uh, you can ask questions that will just drop them to their knees. And that requires a level of courage because in order for the question to work, we have to be willing to ask the same question of ourselves. And if we, if we aren't, they will know. So what we have to show up with is a very, very high level of acceptance. Um, there's a woman whose name is Tara Brock who calls it radical acceptance, uh, meaning acceptance of ourselves and acceptance of others. Um, together with um, a willingness to look into the depths. Um, uh, Nietzsche says, that when you look into the abyss, the abyss looks into you. And when we look into conflict, the conflict looks into us. So the question is, what really are those questions? Um, and I think there are dozens and dozens, hundreds, maybe an infinite number of answers to that question. But here's one that is that I especially like. Um, it's very powerful and it's very simple and it's non-judgmental, uh, but it stops people in their tracks. And that is in the midst of an argument, just stop for a second and interrupt them in the middle of their argument and say, excuse me, can I ask you a question? And at first, they may not give you permission, but you ask it again. Uh, may I, may I, can I ask you a question? Sure. Here's the question. Is this conversation working? And they know it isn't working. So everybody's going to say no. But in order to say no, you have to have stopped the conversation that wasn't working, stepped outside of it, looked back at it, made an assessment or evaluation of it, reached a conclusion about it, and been willing to say in front of the other person what your conclusion was, it isn't working. Question two, would you like it to work? Who wouldn't like it to work? Of course, the answer is yes. Why would you like it to work? Don't tell me. Tell her why you'd like it to work. And now let's ask a couple of other questions. What is one thing you think the other person could do that would make this conversation work better for you? 
And are you willing to do that? And what is one thing that they could do that would make it work better for you? And are you willing to do that? Can we start the conversation over again and try those out and see if those work? And now here's another step. Um, on a scale of, after you've had that conversation, um, on a scale of one to 10, 10 being highest, how would you rank the conversation you were having before I asked you that question? They'll say two, zero, minus four, something like that. How would you rank the conversation you're having right now? Seven, eight, okay. What would it take to make it a 10? Okay, now these are really simple, non-judgmental questions, but everybody knows um, this is a conversation that isn't working. We've got to figure out some way out of it. Um, and the way out is once you look at it, obvious, but when you're in it, you just can't see it. Um, and there are lots and lots of questions like that that we can ask that stop the process right in its tracks. And everybody stops the forward movement or the backward movement, whichever it is, and now comes right into the present. And as soon as they're in the present and looking at what is working and what isn't working, they've already stepped out of the conversation that wasn't working. I think that's so important to our listeners. I had a, a, a similar experience where it was a pivotal ah. moment where it was over and back going on. I said, with your permission, is it okay if we pause here? And then we just explored. Beautiful. Okay, so what are your obs what are your yeah. observations? Yeah, beautiful. And it's so simple yeah. when you, you do that. Saying that, that's where to borrow your book title is mediating dangerously. Is we have to take risks yeah. as mediators then to do that in a very neutral, impartial way. Yet you're bringing real authenticity and honesty and empathy into yeah. the conversation and we're able to bring them away from the details up to okay what are we how, how are we working yeah. together here? so as an illustration um here's the question which is what is the most risky conversation you can have what is the most dangerous mm -hmm. one and it's not the one that you're most afraid of in the traditional sense uh it's the one that you want most badly um, so here's are some other questions uh, that you could ask, um, kind of dangerous questions. Um, uh, uh, what is one thing that you would most like the other person to acknowledge you for? And that's a tough question because it asks you to open your heart in the presence of someone that you don't trust or don't like or whatever. Now, the, the, the question is, where do those questions come from? And the answer is from the empathy and the honesty coming together inside of me and then trying to figure out what is a skillful way that I could ask this question so as to not produce skillful meaning, I get the kind of answer that I'm looking for. And the kind of answer is the one that helps someone become authentic in the presence of someone who they're defended against. Um, uh, so why do you care so deeply about this? What life experiences have you had that have led you to feel so passionately about this issue? What does it mean to you? Um, here's one of my favorite questions. What question would you most like the other person to ask you right now? And you just, you, know, you have to stop and think about that. What is the question I really would like the other person to most, most want the other person to ask me? And there are two pieces of this. One piece is uh, this reflection where you've stepped back and you're now thinking about this. But the other piece is hidden in the words, most want, which is a heart opening. And so uh, it is, it, the da most dangerous thing that you can do is to open your heart 
to someone that you don't trust. Um, and we tend to protect that part of us uh, very zealously. Um, there, there's a, the, the, the idea of mediating dangerously really comes from a phrase from uh, Goethe, the German writer Goethe, who said uh, in quotes, uh, the dangers in life are infinite and among them is safety. So when does safety become dangerous? And the answer is, if you play it safe in the presence of a conflict, you, don't, you just don't do anything. Uh, you don't open your mouth. You just say, oh, okay, and move away. Uh, so to be a mediator is already to take a, a very dangerous step, which is to try to open up this Pandora's box of who knows what's, what evils lurk inside, um, uh, or what pain um, you may experience as a result of opening it up. And it's really more pain that we're talking about. Uh, so having the ability to be in the presence of pain ends up reducing suffering. So pain and suffering are different things. Um, and in part, we experience suffering because we're unable to be in touch with the pain. But to help people be in touch with their pain ends up being healing. Um, as opposed to running away from it or blaming it and trying to push it off onto someone else, um, or simply trying to call attention, other people's attention to it in ways that are not especially skillful, meaning they don't produce the result that you want. So all of these I think are, are uh, grow out of your question. Um, and I think it is out of that art of asking questions that the highest level of mediation takes place. If we can find those questions, the ones that are just right for these people, that's a, a tremendous step forward. I, I have two practice questions. I've asked these all the time. So when I am teaching mediation and um, we do uh, training and we offer certificates, uh, to people uh, to become practice mediators. And I'm often asked a question, how do you come up with these questions when I'm you know, doing an observations or role play? And people go, well, do you have a question bank where you have some wonderful questions ready on hand? Or do you do it like uh, artfully, that creativity? Now, for me, it's very creative. I don't have go-to questions. Do you have like a question bank where you're going to go, okay, I got a bit like a library of, of questions that you have. This is a good one here. Or yeah. how do you operate? Ken? Well, I have questions that end up being um, uh, uh, commonly useful, but uh, there's no mm. one thing, one question, one statement, one act that you can perform that is always going to work for everyone, everywhere, every time. Yeah. But for example, yeah. in family um, conflicts, um, yeah. there's a kind of core problem. And the core problem is that the family is a, uh, uh, a place, uh, it's a relationship that we deeply want to have with other people. It's an intimate place. Um, uh, it's a place of caring. And yet we don't feel that caring. So here uh, are, I have four questions that I will commonly ask um, or often ask in family mediations. Um, and again, I don't always do it, but here's question one. What words or phrases would you use to describe the kind of family you most want to have? And again, that most want to have part. Um, and then people will say, for example, well, I want a family that's respectful. And I'll write it down like on the flip chart behind you, um, respectful. Uh, I want a family that's honest. I want a family that's caring. So the one who says I want a family that's respectful has just told you they feel disrespected. 
the family that the one that wants a family that's honest feels lied to. The one that wants a family that's caring feels uncared for. So we've gotten some information now about what people want. Here's question two. Does anyone disagree with any of these words? Who would disagree? Who doesn't want a family that's caring or honest or uh, uh, respectful? So everybody says, yes. Okay, congratulations. You just reached consensus. That's the kind of family you want to have. Now, question three. Um, are each of you prepared in this conversation that we are about to have right now to begin living up to those words? To do your best to be in this conversation respectful and honest and caring. Everybody will say yes. Question four. Do any of us have permission to stop the conversation if we begin moving away from those words? And everyone will say yes. And now we're in a totally different place in beginning. And now we can say, okay, why? What is it that has actually happened that has led you to feel disrespected, lied to, uncared for? Now let's dig in. But notice we've created a context, a framework, even a kind of uh, a set of goals for the conversation that everybody has bought into. We've reached consensus uh, and we've got permission now, not only permission, but we've invited people to stop the conversation if they feel that it isn't working for them. And that's really, really useful. I really like how you have the frame there. And once you have the frame, you have consensus, which gives you permission to even be more dangerous exactly. in remediation. What, what, what a lovely way to start. You have a perfect frame yeah. there. And you, talk, you talked about the mediation process being a healing process because we're, we're, we're allowing to see that pain emerge, moving away from that suffering. And a lot of mediators see the benefits of mediation and see themselves as a helper. And then in, in your book, we're talking about sometimes where the helper can be in the way, get in the way. And, and you, you mentioned that lovely African proverb, uh, let me help you or you will, do you will drown, placing the fish safely in the tree. I love that. So what are those pitfalls that, because we're so eager to assist and yeah. help, how might we get in the way of the mediation process? Yeah, this is, this is a really good question, William. This episode was brought to you in association with the Mediation Foundation of Ireland, Europe's premier provider of mediation certification and training. For more information, check out mfi.ie. The, the difficulty is that mediation is a kind of helping profession. Uh, and one of the chapters mm. in Mediating Dangerously is called When Helping Becomes a Hindrance. And um, it starts with a quotation from a man who was in Alcoholics Anonymous, who said, in quotes, uh, if one more person had tried to help me, I would have killed myself. And why? You, ask, you wonder, why is that the case? And it, tur there, it turns out there's a very nice idea from Sigmund Freud, uh, which is called counterfeit nurturance, which means helping someone in a way that undermines their self-confidence and belief in their ability to help themselves. So genuine helping is actually a form of coaching. Uh, it's a way of kind of revealing to people that they actually do have the ability to help themselves uh, and offering them support from the outside but it turns out that there's a form of helping that is actually a kind of boundary violation, which is to step in and do things for people um, that stops them from doing them themselves. I think of it as the uh, young kid who helps the little old lady cross the street when she doesn't want to cross the street. 
<laughs> uh, something yeah. like this. Or more importantly, more uh, accurately, I think, uh, is that many people in conflict are in internal conflict over whether they want one thing or another thing. And to jump in and decide for them which of those things you're going to help them get uh, is a kind of boundary violation as well. And it cheats them out of the opportunity to discover for themselves what it is that they really want and get to the bottom of their problems. And at the same time, learn a set of problem solving skills that will be useful to them in facing similar types of problems. So um, the question is, I think for each of us, uh, we have all faced countless problems in our lives. And we have had interactions with people who have been helpful to us in solving our problems. But if we ask the question, what is the most helpful thing anyone has done for you when you were facing a problem? Chances are the answer is not solve it for me. Um, but help me have the confidence to face it myself. Give me an outside perspective on what the problem looks like to them. Ask me questions that require me to think about the problem and give me new tools and looking at it in a different way. Those are the sorts of things. Someone who's going to stand by me while I face this problem, hold my hand, whatever it may happen to be. All of those are things that are useful, um, but that stop short of um, you know, st solving the problem for the person. And of course, we know this as mediators because um, it's, we know that it's not our problem, that they have to reach agreements. And so we pass back to them responsibility for problem solving, but we do it in a way that doesn't just keep them stuck. We do it in a way that helps them figure out that they really actually do have the ability to discuss this and to look at it and to learn from each other about what is a solution that would work best for both of them. And that's taking something that's simple and making it complex. And that means that it's not a favored approach because the simplest thing to do is to just yell and scream and blame somebody else. There are really two fundamentally simple approaches to, problem to problems. One, there is no problem. And two, it's your fault. And we do both of those very quickly. But anything more than that takes work. And the question is, is it worth the work? And what we have to fundamentally come to is the realization that the work is not really external only. It is internal as well. So while we are solving the problem, we are becoming problem solvers. And we're not just solving that problem, we're solving all problems that are similar to that problem. We're creating an algorithm for problem solving that will be helpful to us in the future. That's where I really like where coaching meets mediation. It's giving people agency. It's that principle of self-determination, that empowerment. They do the problem solving themselves. And when I, when I started my mediation practice, then I found it quite easy to move into the coaching aspect there because it's really about reflecting, well, what's really important for me? And then what are my options available to, for me to explore? And that, that allows me then to explore then, well, what's that internal conflict within me? And what's my relationship with conflict? And in your book, you mentioned like the family of origin where, you know, this is why conflict, where do we learn conflict? And are, are the ideas about conflict comes from our early relationships with our parents or family, siblings, cousins, childhood friends, teachers. So can you tell us a little bit more about if we gain more of an understanding into how we see conflict 
here in your book, you, you talk about there's few of us experienced positive examples of resolution, transformation, and transcendence. I really like that. Very nice. Here's a, an example. Um, babies, when they are born, uh, if you put them, two babies next to each other, they hardly know that the other baby is there. And they experience... I'm a twin, yeah. I know that. <laughs> yeah, the twins are a little different. <laughs> twins actually do know that yeah. the other twin is there. Um, and that's, they, they, I think twins have something deeper. Uh, my daughter has twins, so I, I could, I've watched this uh, in operation. They actually sense and communicate with each other at a deep level. Um, but uh, what happens is that if the other baby doesn't really exist for you, there's no conflict. But at a certain point, and if you give the baby a toy and the baby will play with the toy, the, baby, the other baby takes it away, first baby hardly even knows, no conflict. But then they come a point where they see each other, they recognize each other, and if one baby takes the toy away, well, the first baby cries, yells, screams, bites, kicks, whatever it may happen to be. Um, which is, you can think of as an unskillful approach to the conflict that is created as a result of the depriving you of the thing that you are looking for, so, uh, or that you want. But then what you do is you discover that you can sort of play with each other uh, and you transition from what's called uh, parallel play to cooperative play. And cooperative play means, okay, you take the ball, but then you pass it back and I pass it back to you. And now we're having some fun, okay? So the point is that all of the conflicts that those babies experience will be experienced in the transition from one stage to a higher stage. And the higher stage is more complex, requires more skills. You have to learn how to deal with the fact that the other baby doesn't pass the toy back and ask, figure out how to ask them to do that, all of those difficulties. And so what, but then once you have done that, those you have then, you haven't exactly solved the problem or resolved the conflict on one level or settled it. What you have done is you have evolved beyond it so that it is no longer a conflict before you because you now have the skills to be able to turn it into something different. You kind of learn how to, to ride that bicycle uh, or to surf that wave or whatever it may happen to be. And the question is, how do you learn this? And I think this is, here it comes a couple of answers. One is of course, just out of raw experience. Um, but the, I think that there are a couple of other answers. One is that we learn in our families of origin certain fundamental approaches to conflict. Uh, one, uh, as babies, your parents are in charge. They get to dictate what happens and we just have to do whatever it is that they say. So accommodation comes easy to us. Um, and secondly comes uh, avoidance where uh, the parent says, do this, and we just pay no attention. Um, uh, and then there are relationships based on power, uh, where the parent has the power, for example, to take us somewhere, and we have the power to throw a tantrum um, and make life miserable for the parent. Uh, so there's the power to say yes and the power to say no, and we learn about that. Uh, and then we move into the workplace with these skills, and we discover that other people don't particularly care for these skills. They don't work. And we have to learn higher order skills of co collaboration and compromise. And so, um, and first of course comes compromise and then collaboration as we know comes much, much later. Um, but here we get something uh, that is, uh, an interesting point of trade-off, which is that uh, we discover that for each of these options, there are a set of relationships and there are a set of internal emotional states 
that we develop inside of ourselves in response to conflicts in those locations, uh, in those forms. And out of those, the best come from collaboration. We're happiest. We have the most fun when we are in relationship with other people that we're working closely with. We're in teams. We're cooperating. We're working together to co solve a common problem. And there is a form of pleasure that comes from that that is really pretty amazing. And it uh, is more powerful than the pleasure that we get, I think, from getting things our own way and being alone by ourselves. So both of those are forms of pleasure, but the teamwork piece of this is really important. How do we learn teamwork? Well, the answer is on some level through what we're going, we can simply think of as culture. Uh, and culture is um, my, my, you know, sort of, we can define culture in many ways, but here's the way that I think of it most importantly for us. It is a way of attributing meaning. So what is the meaning of um, uh, conflict to anyone? Uh, and one of the things that it means is um, we are now uh, no longer able to have this collaborative relationship, this enjoyable relationship with other people, this caring relationship. We are deprived of caring. And as children, we know that we grow and become stronger as a result of caring, the, the love of our parents, the love of others around us. Uh, and that love helps us have the self-confidence that we need to navigate the world. Um, and then the second piece of this is that we um, discover that we can lose our way without it. Uh, there's, a, there's a very simple scientific experiment that demonstrates this. Uh, if I were to hold up right now uh, a large glass bowl, and inside the glass bowl were, you know, they just lots and lots of jelly beans. Um, and the question is, how many jelly beans are in the bowl? Um, do you know what the, the closest to correct answer is? The answer is the average of everybody's suggestions for how many are in the bowl. Because some people will go high and other people will go low. And when you average them out, they end up being pretty much close to what is actually in the bowl. Um, so the point of this is that we understand that by collaborating, we are able to solve our problems more effectively. We, have, we come up with better solutions. So these are all reasons why we need to have conflict resolution skills, especially in the workplace, um, and why it is that um, we need to figure out, coming out of our families of origin, how to evolve beyond what we learned from our mothers and fathers about how to handle conflicts. And every generation has to do this. They have to discover for themselves um, their own ways of doing this. Um, and fortunately, there is a kind of evolution. But once you evolve to this higher order, um, the conflicts you seem to have before just kind of disappear. Nobody in their 40s has conflicts with their parents over curfew because you've already figured out how to solve the problem. Your parents have given it up and you've given up caring what they think about when you come home at night. So that, that's just uh, an example of how the conflicts that we face, and I wrote another book which is called The Crossroads of Conflict. And what it says basically is that every conflict takes place at a crossroads that is defined on the one hand by a problem that we are now required to solve in order to evolve and grow, like the problem of how we play with this other baby. And on the other hand, by the fact that we do not yet have the skills we need in order to solve it. 
But what this means is that every conflict points us directly at what we most need to learn in order to grow and evolve as human beings. That's powerful. That's really the spiritual role, if we can think of it this way, of the mediator. Can I sure. ask a question about teams? I do a lot of conflict within teams and sometimes it's about are people ready, willing and able to have that conversation about conflict? And sometimes when you go at a deeper level, then if you're doing team coaching. Well, what's our relationship with conflict? You know, do you find people are willing to talk about their family of ours and where where they learn conflict came from and allow themselves to be vulnerable and that psychological safety, you know, for, from your experience of working in teams, you know, I'm just curious about that because there's an element, well, because I design workshops then much like you, well, do they have the skills or is it that they're, they're just, they don't trust you. So they're not willing to, to be vulnerable. Well, the, just curious about yeah. Your great question. The, the culture of the workplace is one that offers a certain amount of privacy. And what that says is you can't come into a team environment and say, tell me about your mothers uh, and your fathers and, and that sort of question. But what you can do is you can ask if someone, you can say, for example, um, what are the things that people do um, or say um, that are triggers for you uh, that push your buttons? What are some examples? And then the question, second question, when was the first time you experienced that as a problem? And the answer will come be in my family of origin. And now the purpose of this is not to go into what happened in your family of origin, but instead to play kind of the role of coach of saying, uh, what did you do then? And what would you like to do now? Did that work? Um, is that successful as an approach? Have you considered other possible approaches? Um, how about this? Or what, a, you know, uh, what other people have learned? Something along those lines. So I think you have to address it a little bit differently uh, in a team environment. This episode was brought to you in association with the Mediation Foundation of Ireland. Europe's premier provider of mediation certification and training. For more information, check out mfi.ie. Okay. So uh, the, the second question is not so much what is it that people say or do um, that uh, is upsetting to you, um, but what is it about that uh, that causes you to get stuck? And what might you do to get unstuck? Usually, uh, the places where we get stuck, which we can think of simply as the places of impasse or the places of conflict, are places where there are two or more truths, two or more paths forward, um, two or more ways of solving the problem. And uh, what we are looking for is ordinarily some way of choosing between those two, as opposed to figuring out how to combine them in some creative way that captures the advantages of both and uh, 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 diminishes the disadvantages. That's more, much more complex. And it can't be done without dialogue. So um, we can create a kind of internal dialogue inside of ourselves, but a team dialogue is much more effective because then other people will say the things uh, that are important. So um, teams can become coaches. Uh, peer coaching is a very useful thing for teams to do, um, in which everybody looks at a problem um, and examines it from different perspectives. Like for example, 
here's a common team problem. What do we do in about people who are not pulling their weight in doing the work? So some people are working hard, other people are not. How do we handle that? Well, in order to answer that, we first have to figure out why is it a problem for you that people don't pull their weight? Meaning, what is it specifically that you feel when people do that? I Maybe I feel disrespected because here I am working hard and they're not helping, so therefore they don't care about me. Or maybe I feel jealous because I would like to take time off, but I don't give myself permission to do so. Uh, or maybe I feel um, left behind uh, or left out, and I've just decided to drop out uh, because nobody really cares about what I think. Uh, nobody cares about me. Whatever it may happen to be, looking at it from that vantage point gives us some understanding of what we can then do in response to the problem that will be much more effective. And teams can do that really beautifully. So I would say that one of the steps would be first identify what are the problems that the team needs to deal with. Uh, and secondly, brainstorm a whole range of solutions. Um, or actually, secondly, would be try to understand it from the inside. Uh, what would make me act like that? You can ask that as a question. Uh, and then what, do we, what are some things that other people can do that could help someone in that position? I think if people are listening in here, they'll realize that your questions are very clean. The language that you use, the pronouns, Everton ha has a positive outcome or a way of where it's, it's done without, without bias or without any impartiality. Can you tell me just a, a little bit about the importance of language then and, and how using different pronouns can make a difference? Yes, uh, two things. First of all, everything that I'm saying uh, I'm saying uh, as a result of some mistake that I've made, okay. um, some sc colossal screw up of some kind. So if there is some, you know, sort of cleanliness to the questions, it's because I've figured out how not to ask them out of experience, and I'm trying to pass that on. Um, but on pronouns, um, I have written a short little piece, which is about um, uh, conflict and pronouns. And if we think about it, we can take every pronoun and put it in three categories. One, what is the pronoun itself? Two, what is the form of the pronoun? And three, what is the likely consequence of using that pronoun? So every conflict conversation, argument, uh, I shouldn't say everyone, but many of them, will begin with a single word, and the word is you, said in a negative way. So all you need is that word you said in that way, and we're off and running. Why? Because the form of the word you is, the, is it, it, that it is an accusation. And what are you going to get as a result of an accusation? Answer, counter accusation, and denial okay. every time. Um, if you say the about a problem, like for example, you are lazy or they are lazy, what is that they? And the answer is it's a stereotype. And what are you gonna get? And the answer is prejudgment or prejudice. But if we switch to it, as in there is a lot of work to be done, how should it be divided? Nobody's going to be defensive or counter accusing or feeling stereotyped or prejudged because you've treated the problem as an it. Or it can also be an I, uh, which becomes either a confession uh, or a request. And the request is, can you give me a hand? Or it can become a we. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do here. How should we divide it? 
And notice that each of those different pronouns produces a fundamentally different outcome. So uh, um, uh, this is just at the level of the very first word that we say. The second word is a verb. And the verb is usually you are, which is a kind of global judgment of who you are, as opposed to you did, or you could, or how about if you, uh, or any of those other things. So um, we can see that the verb also can contribute to the problem. And finally comes the accusation itself, as in the word lazy. So what do we, we can take any accusation, but if we tease it apart, and I wrote a book, another book, uh, which is called The Dance of Opposites, and the first chapter is called The Language of Conflict, in which I do an analysis of this. Um, and if you take apart the accusation, you're going to find the following levels. First, every accusation is a negative, indirect, statement of interests, as in you are lazy is a negative, indirect way of saying uh, I need help. Secondly, every accusation is also at the same time a negative, indirect statement of emotion, meaning I feel disrespected because you aren't helping me. Um, or undervalued or whatever the words might be that you would choose. But there is a statement of emotion which is turned negative and made indirect. And with each of those, we can make it direct and positive. As in, I would really appreciate it if you could give me a hand. That would make me feel that you care about me and about the work that we have that is helping both of us. However it is that you would say that. Uh, and then there are deeper levels. Um, there's a third level uh, of the accusation, which is that it is a um, perception of um, uh, a, uh, a, a, let's put it this way, a deep-seated relational doubt. Meaning, I don't really know how you feel about me. And you're not being willing to do what I want feels to me like you don't care about me. And what's deeper than that, the fourth level, is there is a deep-seated self-doubt, which is um, maybe I don't deserve to be respected. And now we have a really good reason for the insult or the accusation. So, but the point of this is to see if this is the stuff that's beneath the surface, we have to dig down to that level in order to dismantle the insult. And it starts with a pronoun and then goes to the verb and then goes to the accusation. And then we can look at the whole story. We can look at narratives. Uh, which are not just stories about what happened, but about people, teams. In every organization, there are narratives about this group or that group or the other group. Well, this is what they're like in HR. And this is what they're like in marketing. And this is what they're like over in this department, whatever it may happen to be. And people feel stereotyped and prejudged. If you ask them, do you feel stereotyped? by others in your workplace, the answer will be usually yes. And we now we could like an opportunity to describe what it feels like um, and to tell people what you actually do. And people will love that opportunity. Sure. Yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure they would uh, love that opportunity. And it's really about an opportunity to be understood. And sometimes people themselves, this is where coaching comes in, they don't understand themselves as yes. a where what's driving this emotion or this behavior or this language pattern that you're speaking of. And speaking of narratives in organizations, I'm really, I know we talked about this, is conflict system design or re, um, conflict resolution systems design, should I say? And you've written a book uh, about this. So 
with this in mind, what are, do you do? Do you have a methodology? Do you have certain factors? Do you do an audit? What are the key components when we are looking at uh, conflict resolution systems design within organizations? Very good. So uh, there's a wonderful book that was written by William Urey, Steve Goldberg, and Jean Brett called Getting Disputes Resolved in the 90s. And it's the origin of the idea of conflict resolution systems design. And then there are a number of books that have been written about it, and I've written about it in a book called Resolving Conflicts at Work, and in a book that I just finished uh, with Joan Goldsmith, which is called uh, Mediating Organizational Conflicts uh, uh, and Designing Sy Preventative Systems. Uh, we're still figuring out the exact title. Uh, that'll be out in the fall, a um, couple of months. And the first thing is to see that conflict itself is a system. And a system is something that turns in a circle. And so what we want to do is to, or a cycle. Uh, and so what we want to do is to stop the cycle at some point. Every point where there is input, there is a point of opportunity to do something to influence the cycle. And it's possible at the very, very beginning to do a series of things. One is what I call a conflict audit. And a conflict audit is fundamentally an effort to look at the sources of conflict, the systemic sources of conflict in any organization, um, and then to try to put a, uh, uh, a financial figure on the, those conflicts so that organizations can see how much it's costing them. And here's the simplest question you can ask that will give you a figure that will lead that organization to decide perhaps to hire you uh, at some incredibly uh, exorbitant fee uh, to try and fix things. Um, and the question is this, how much time does the average manager in this organization spend on unresolved conflicts? And I can tell you in the United States, the figure is about 25% average for managers across the board. And I think that's low. I really, I think that's seriously low. And all you have to do is take that 25%, multiply it by the average manager's salary and multiply it by the number of managers and you get one figure. Uh, how much time does the average employee spend in this organization gossiping, spreading rumors, you know, um, you know uh, uh, being worried about uh, unresolved conflicts, being sick uh, because of stress created by conflicts. Uh, and you can look at the whole organization and come up with numbers. Um, how much is spent on lawyers uh, that you wouldn't have to spend if you could resolve these conflicts earlier? So those are some of the things that can be done. That's the very first part of the process. And then there are a series of stages, and those are outlined uh, in, I think, probably most usefully in either resolving conflicts at work uh, or at um, uh, in uh, uh, the dance of opposites. But I also wrote a book about political conflicts where I attempt to use this um, idea of systems design to look at political, social, economic, and political conflicts and to say, how could we use systems design uh, in order to not just uh, resolve, transform, and transcend conflicts, but how to prevent them from happening in the first place. And it turns out, shockingly, that it's possible to do that. Wow. I know, pretty amazing. One last question, if that's okay with you. And, I, and I'd like to ask sure. you about the political, or maybe two questions, if you'll permit me that. The first question is, with this new way of working hybrid, you know, the workplace of the future, where do you see mediation as a role in the organization? Do you always see it as, uh, you know, what do you think the trends are? Do you always see it as it's going to be an external uh, mediator that comes in, or do you see it as a function of the HR department? Okay, so um, uh, in my view, there are three generations of systems design. 
the first generation looks at conflict resolution systems within the organization. What happens for people who are in conflict? Uh, how, how rich are those um, uh, resolution procedures? Have we got loopbacks to negotiation, safety nets for people who fall through the cracks, uh, et cetera? The second generation of systems design is applying the idea of conflict resolution systems design to the chronic sources of conflict within every aspect of the organization. Are there conflicts, for example, in organizations over reward and compensation systems? Well, of course there are. And would it be possible for a mediator to look at those reward and compensation systems and rethink them from a conflict resolution point of view? And the answer is yes. And the same is true of feedback and evaluation systems, performance appraisal systems, um, uh, leadership selection systems, work assignment systems, hire and fire systems, et cetera. That's the second generation of systems design that now looks at everything in the organization from a conflict resolution point of view. And the third generation of systems design is to apply systems design ideas to systems design itself and to reconfigure the way that we do systems design in order to fit the exact features of whatever organization or problem we're attempting to solve. So there might be a different form that systems design would take in a family dispute. If you're trying to design a family from a conflict resolution point of view, what would you do? Uh, or for a couple or for a workplace or for a community dispute? Uh, and now what about this organization as opposed to that organization? And now we're in the field of culture and trying to figure out how we work with culture in order of organizational culture in order to create um, the kind of shifts that we want. And one of the undeveloped pieces of systems design is the cultural piece. And yet the culture is probably the most powerful thing in any organization. And if we can impact that, we can make incredibly powerful changes throughout the organization. I am, I cannot wait to read the, that book that comes out in fall. It's going right. to be a wonderful read. So I'm conscious of our time. All right. Uh, is it okay to ask one more question about the political landscape where, sure. or, or, or do you have time? Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you for that. I really appreciate that. Okay. So you were talking about political conflict and that book mediating in a time of crisis and i'm really curious to how that how mediation plays a role in the times right. that we find ourselves in uh i think we could spend easily another hour or 10 yeah. or 12 on this one uh, i did write two books one is called conflict revolution uh designing um, preventative systems for social, economic, and political conflicts, and a second one called Politics, Dialogue, and the Evolution of Democracy, uh, in addition to the one I mentioned, which is politics, uh, which is mediation in a time of crisis. Um, and the purpose of these is to look into these issues in detail. Um, but it turns out that there are a series of things that can be done. For example, in the United States, we had um, uh, the uh, uh, Democratic Party primaries where various candidates were running to run against Donald Trump. Uh, and the difficulty was, and they hired me, one of the organizations that was doing this work, political organization, to help them because um, they had people who supported Bernie Sanders and people who supported Elizabeth Warren and people who supported Joe Biden. Um, and as soon as you said the word Bernie, or Elizabeth, or Joe, or Pete, or any of those words, all conversation stopped. So the question is, what questions could you ask that would stop with, that would allow the conversation to continue? So here are three. One, uh, what life experiences have you had 
that have led you to feel so passionately about this issue. Two, without mentioning the name of the candidate that you like, what values do you believe your candidate stands for? And three, how could we use those values to help us have a better conversation right now? So those are just three small examples. There are hundreds and hundreds of those, and they work. And we've got to figure out how to use them because we're facing climate change and a series of divisive issues, and we've got to figure out on a global scale how to work together and collaborate in solving global problems. So thank you very much, William, for this. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you, and it's really been fun. I've enjoyed it. And thank you so much for your time today. You've been very generous with that. Uh, thank you coming on to the, for coming on to the Workplace Podcast. My pleasure, William. Bye-bye. That's it for this episode of the Workplace Podcast. My special thanks to this week's guest for a wonderful discussion. If you want to get in contact with a podcast about a workplace topic or a particular challenge that you're facing, contact me via Twitter at Different Paths. You can also connect with me on LinkedIn, William Corless, C-O-R-L-E-S-S, or go to my website, www.yellowwood.ie. Yellowwood, your external learning and development partner, provider executive coaching, facilitation, and training. Take a different path to success with your career, leadership, team, and organization.